there's never been a more exciting time to be a woman in wearables. Compared to your laptop or smartphone, a wearable device is considerably more personal. It's a privilege to speak with almost a thousand like-minded individuals in this innovation hub of Toronto. Meta's chief scientist, Professor Steve Mann, refers many of his engineers from his lab at the University of Toronto. During his recent sabbatical at Meta, whoops, is that? Oh, okay. During his recent sabbatical, he recreated his augmented reality lab at Meta. It's, such a, it's so inspiring to see his daughters get excited about our tech. He says they started building wearable computers when they were only nine. As VP of Finance and Operations, I am part of the founding team at Meta, where we are building the natural machine. We want user interfaces to be easy enough for toddlers and grandparents alike to learn. Using neuroscience principles, we're able to make using computers as intuitive as your own body. We are all innovating on how humans interact with computers, so we must recognize diversity in the population and build diverse teams. Since industries such as wearables and AR are still in their nascence, now is the time for women to make an impact. Inclusivity of women has never been as important as when designing wearable tech. So many wearables focus on health and safety, interact with or even touch your body, and become fashion statements. In these new form factors, there are issues that we may not anticipate. The journey of building wearable computers is an exhilarating but grueling adventure. Growing up in New York, I cared deeply about women's issues. However, it wasn't until I worked in Silicon Valley that I became truly fired up about them. You're about to hear a snapshot of my journey, the challenges I see for women, and how we can take action together. Being on a small executive team at Meta, I always felt heard. For the first year, the fact that I was a woman rarely even crossed my mind. As we grew, I started to stand out. harder. Anyone going after me? <laughs> so as we grew, I started to stand out. It's easy to get acclimated and dismiss it as the status quo. As we grew, we quickly hired more women, but our stats, 15 to 30 percent, moved me to reach out to them. A few of the older women laughed or sighed. This is the way it is in tech. I checked industry trends, and we were on par with most other tech companies but it bothered me, and I wanted to eventually make change. Since I attended a Bar Barnard College, the all-women's school at Columbia University, being the only woman on a team was a new experience for me. Speaking of pink pussy hats, a Barnard woman designed that hat. Christosa, 09. Um, since age eight, I was drawn to female role models. I was captivated by the sixth century poem ballad of Mulan. If you're familiar with the tale, you remember that Mulan used armor to masquerade as a man and represent her family in battle. Her fellow soldiers had no idea, and she saved her elderly father from having to serve. Her prerogative compelled me. Imagine at age eight, reciting a five-minute poem in front of hundreds of people. I was later surprised when the cartoon version of the tale turned this classic story of a woman achieving equality into a love story. Mulan, with her medieval wearable technology, was the first woman to inspire me. Years later, at my high school graduation, I felt the impacts of society's portrayal of women. The two years ahead of me for their alumni speakers had Sex and the City actress Cynthia Nixon and songwriter Robert Lopez of Avenue Q and Frozen's Let It Go. My class listened to Mildred Dresselhaus, a famed physicist. She was the first female institute professor at MIT, first and only female winner of the National Medal of Science and Engineering, and recent recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I'm embarrassed to say, my friends and I were excited over accomplished artists, but not over pioneering female scientists. Little did I know that Mildred, with her foundational studies on carbon and nanotechnology, paved the way for all of us women to miniaturize electronics. Getting back to how I became a woman in wearables. Entering Barnard College, I had very disparate interests. I majored in classics, and I was pre-med. My first year, I was recruited to work in the IT lab. I likened my interest in IT to my aspirations of becoming a neurosurgeon. I planned to write my med school application comparing understanding and fixing computers 
to understanding and fixing human bodies. Thinking about it now, I get to enjoy both passions by building wearable computers. We all come into a career in technology in different ways. Obviously, I didn't go into medicine. And to the relief of my parents, I didn't go into classics. Instead, I continued working in IT and eventually in digital marketing. I took post back classes in business to further explore my interests. In 2012, catching up with a friend, I said, I'm taking this exciting class at Columbia Business School on how to launch a startup. That friend was Miron Gribitz, CEO and founder of Meta. He was trying to build augmented reality glasses, and I was intrigued because he was always rushing home early to hack together prototypes. In 2012, oh, a few months later, Miron called me. You have to try this prototype. It finally works. It was the eve of Hurricane Sandy, and the whole city was preparing for the power to go out. I braved the storm. My interest was piqued, and I had to try this demo. A 45-minute subway ride later, I was playing with a virtual spaceship on the first Meadow One prototype. Marone said to me, I cannot build a business without you. No one else I know can juggle as much as you can. Over the next nine months, still maintaining a corporate day job, I spent evenings and weekends helping to build Meta. I initiated business partnerships, managed our Kickstarter campaign, tracked expenses, built and demoed prototypes, and coordinated communications across a global team. In April 2013, we needed money, so I scoured the web for angel investors. I came across a Google Plus article that said, Google Glass is disappointing. Wearable computing devices need to be social. This resonated with me. It was exactly what Meadow was trying to do. I agonized over an introductory email to the writer, Yi Li. A week later, we were at Anna's office with this setup. That morning, we had rushed to build it for our interview with a startup incubator, Y Combinator. The first box contained our prototype. Prior to my flight to San Francisco, I stayed up all night heating the X-Acto knife over my stove to meticulously cut the plastic. Second box contained our partner's then prototype of slimmer optics. And the third contained our vision for the future of AR glasses. Driving from our interview to Yi's office, I prepped Maron on everything I learned about Yi's passions. Yi said, yes, I'm in. You're focused on the two most important areas. One, placing the sensors correctly to map the real world. And two, working full stack from hardware all the way to user applications. You are the most ambitious team I've met. That was our first Silicon Valley moment. And he hadn't even touched my boxes. <laughs> No other investor to date has agreed to invest even before trying our demo. My research paid off. A month later, Meadow was featured at AWE, the Augmented World Expo. We had also been accepted into Silicon Valley's Y Combinator and rented a house there. That was when Maroon said to me, Karen, it's time to quit your safe corporate job in New York. I negotiated a livable wage and more equity. Ladies, you should always negotiate. <laughs> I hopped onto a red-eye flight home and gave my two weeks notice that very day. A week later, over Father's Day dinner, I casually mentioned, I'm going full time with Meta, so I quit my job. Next week, Bowie and I are flying to California. <laughs> Who doesn't love cats? <laughs> um, I'm a native New Yorker, so on top of my new 24-7 job, I also had to learn how to drive. That was when I grew my first white hair. <laughs> true, very true story. <laughs> so, four years later, Meta is over 120 people. We shipped our first developer kit, the Meta 1, in 2014. When we shipped Meta 2, we learned from our Meta 1 developers to include wider field of view and better ergonomics. In that time, I've gone from hacking together prototypes to learning how to run a business. My role is VP of Finance and Operations. I'm frequently asked, what exactly do you do at Meta? What isn't there to do at a startup? For many years, I was a one-woman finance and operations department. Turns out, the critical thinking I learned studying ancient Greek prepared me for my multifaceted roles at Meta. What I enjoyed most was analyzing every single word. Understanding all the intricacies allowed me to synthesize them into modern-day languages. Today, I derive that same satisfaction and fascination with the ways numbers tell stories in finance. One of my roles is having a pulse on all of our activity and spending. One of the other executives making a play on my name calls me Quan Pewter for my 
natural ability to understand detail and extrapolate valuable information. As Meta's grown, I've done financial analysis and planning, procurement and fulfillment, and scaling up our processes. In our earlier years, I managed the logistics of 30 people working and living together, many of them brilliant, but very messy men. <laughs> As I've grown at Meta, I've been fortunate to find seasoned mentors who help me identify my strengths. Good mentors ask as many questions as they give you good advice. John, our CFO, teaches me about financial modeling and fundraising and continues to ask, what else do you want to learn? Jen, one of our investors, said, Karen, when I was in your role at a robotic startup, I learned the hard way that if you're going to scale, you need disciplined processes in place. And that's when I realized how much I enjoyed operations. And Sherry, an industry CFO, was the one who asked, does the way numbers tell a story excite you? Turns out, yes. And that's how I realized how much I enjoyed finance. You've probably all heard about the recent Silicon Valley scandals around sexual harassment and, fulfill and um, discrimination. Throughout my journey at Meta, I've been fortunate. I always felt judged by my accomplishments and rarely by my gender. Turns out I was lucky to be part of a small tech team where a woman's voice was heard and taken seriously. Learning from our Meta One, ergonomics was crucial, so our team set out to collect data on the size of the average man's head. Our industrial designer, Esther, made sure that it was the size of the average human's head. <laughs> Women's heads are on average on the smaller side. I myself had issues with the Meta One being too loose. In the AR industry, we see similar omissions being made when designing hand and face recognition algorithms when they struggle to recognize dark-skinned people. At Meta, because Esther made a point of collecting a diverse sampling of data, the Meta 2 fits my head comfortably. Most of, our male, most of our customers are male, but that doesn't mean we should exclude our female customers. Meta's right, Esther's right there in the second row, so you can talk to her later about her experience. Thanks, Esther. It's important to have a woman's perspective on a team, such as Esther's. And as we grew rapidly, I grew, I grew increasingly bothered by how few of them we had. I also became increasingly aware of how I was sometimes treated differently because I was a woman. Does it infuriate you when male and female candidates alike defer to your male colleagues, even though you're the one asking the question? Many people also thought that I was dating one of the co-founders. At first it was funny, they felt like my big brothers that I never had, but the painful truth is it bothered me. Did they assume I was part of the company because of a romantic connection? I also got more comments about how young I was, even though our co-founders are only a few years older. One consultant advised, put on more makeup at work to improve your executive presence. I told her, when you work at a startup and you get four hours of sleep, every 15 minutes are precious. I was reinvigorated to take action and began with women's outings and a book club about female leadership. But I still felt like I could do more to make change. Last month, I attended a women in tech conference. I had the good fortune to speak with Gloria Steinem, who has been fighting for women's rights for longer than most of us have been alive. In fact, at age 82, she is as vital and as committed as ever. I asked her the question you would have asked. What should I do to make a difference? She said, Karen, don't focus on what you should do. Focus on what you can do. I left the conference inspired. Driving home, I reflected on how Gloria had invested half a century in getting people to realize that there were inequalities. The next day at work, it was inspiring and refreshing when the mostly male executive team asked, what can we do to help your diversity efforts? I outlined my plan. These are my first three recommendations. One. Here are the openings in our senior leadership team. Let's fill them with women. Two, with the existing 25% of women, women at our company, let's invest in their leadership and teach all employees to recognize bias. And three, here are some events where we can be visible. Sponsoring this event tonight is only the beginning. Our recruiter promised that our next open house would be specifically for women, and we dedicated a budget to improve diversity. I'm so proud of all the conversation I've sparked across all our teams. When it comes to improving diversity, we all have a role, not just those of us in the minority. Together, we make a greater and bigger difference. 
We may not be able to solve all issues in society right away, but you can start from within, your own companies, your own networks. The earlier we start, whether at a small startup or a new industry, the greater our impact. I hope you have a Sherry, a Jen, or a John in your life who has mentored you. Be that person for other women. Draw from your own experience. Share your wisdom. And be sure to tell them, focus on what you can do. Thank you. I don't know.